All right, if everyone could just take their seats, we're gonna get started. Um, my name is Katie, and I have been working on the Mental Health Awareness Week Planning Committee, and we'd just like to thank you so much for coming out to all of our events. Um, and now I'm gonna invite Dr. Golly up here, who's gonna introduce our keynote speaker for the week. Good afternoon, it's my pleasure and my honor to be here in this uh, very important uh, occasion. I'm here because I view uh, mental health as a very important subject matter. Throughout this week, you've been seeing and hearing about the sobering statistics on depression and suicide am amongst medical students and physicians. I want you to know that we at LSU are concerned about the mental health for all students and healthcare providers. Just in the two years that I've been in this position, in an interim role and in a permanent role, we've had three to four uh, students and residents that, again, it's always hard to figure out the e exact situation, but I would put them in, in, the, in the exact category of, of concerns that Dr. Weibel has and why she's here and what we're talking about related to this mental health awareness. Some of you may see the statistics indicating depression and suicide being higher with medical students and physicians as a deterrent to our chosen career path. I do not. I see them as facts that each of us must address. This is why I want to strongly commend the students who created this educational platform on mental health awareness. So thank you very much. Rather than just stand by and watch, these student leaders have chosen to take action, which I am certain will result in many taking needed action to address their depression, feelings of being overwhelmed, or possibly even suicide. I hope each of us will join these concerned students in being cognizant of your fellow students or colleagues who are having a tough time. Don't assume someone else will ask, is there anything I can do to help? Just as compassion and attentiveness to our patients is vital to being a successful physician, it is also essential to being a good friend, mentor, and colleague. Bullying and abuse of authority is unacceptable. As a chancellor, I'm constantly on the lookout for this. And I will tell you, as I tell my faculty, I will kick you out of this institution if you bully. And I, I find bullying as a really unacceptable way and an, an abuse of authority. So that, I believe, causes undue stress on students and residents and fellows, and it is unacceptable in, in, in my mind. I'd like now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Pamela Weibel. I had the opportunity to meet her for the first time, and, and I came on purpose a few minutes early just so I, I would have the opportunity to, to, to talk with Pamela. She's clearly a visionary who has made it her life's work to improve community medicine and to become a national mentor for mental health, for the mental health of medical students and physicians. I'm happy to share that she has some southern roots as she received her MD from UT Galveston before pursuing her residency in family medicine at the University of Arizona. And I, and, I, and I like Galveston, but I'll also tell you that, you know, she resides in Eugene, Oregon. And, and, I, and I love Eugene. It was the very first place when uh, I moved to the U.S. at the age of three from Iraq. And I was born in Iraq, and I came to the U.S. The first place that we went to was Eugene, Oregon. And uh, it's, it's where my mom ended up enrolling in getting her uh, master's degree before she, we came to Texas. And just like you went to Wellesley, it was kind of an all-girls school. Basically, Eugene, Oregon, University of Oregon at the time, she was the only woman in, in her class, uh, in her Master's of Business Administration class. They actually wondered whether she was in the right class or not when she showed up the first day. She goes, no, I'm, this is where I belong, and she was the only girl. 
If I fast forward about 30 years later or so, I was doing a fellowship in Portland, Oregon, and my mom came up to visit me, and she said, hey, can we go and visit Eugene? And I said, sure. And we hadn't been there in, in, in 25 or 30 years. So we went down and drove down to Eugene. And as we, as we got into the town, my mom looked around and says, gosh, this place hasn't changed a bit. It hasn't changed a bit since we were here. So I pulled into the gas station to get some gas, and I asked the guy, and my mom was in the car, I said, let me ask you something. Is there something going on here? Because there's just a bunch of hippies walking around and everything. And the guy's like, oh, dude, man, there's a Grateful Dead concert this morning. <laughs> so, so there you go. Anyway, <laughs> Pamela had, uh, was named one of the 2015 women leaders in medicine and as a physician's guardian angel by Ted Med. Her book entitled Physician Suicide Letters Answered was Amazon's number one best-selling book in 2016. Dr. Weibel's popular blog and articles have been picked up by major media outlets such as the Washington Post and Time Magazine. Her TED Med talks resonated with our particular students resulting in their decision to bring her here to our campus. So without further delay, let's give a warm LSU welcome to Dr. Pamela Weibel. Thank you. Okay, that was a warm welcome, and I've got a funny story about Eugene i got to tell. Now that you introduced that story, right? I mean, oh man, what goes on in Eugene, you'd never believe it. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this one thing. When I first moved to Eugene from Texas, where people are pretty friendly in the South, you know, I was just not used to so many people hugging you all the time. Like, people just... I was walking down, the, I was 29 years old, I just finished residency, I was walking down the street, and literally people are walking up to you smiling like they just had sex with you, you have no idea who these people are. And they're all wanting to hug you and see how you're doing, and they're legitimately interested, they're not fake, you know, like they're really, you know. And, um, and the other thing that's unique about Eugene, I think it has to do with just people are stoned there a lot, you know, so everyone's like really happy, and, um, and it's legal, you know, medical marijuana and all that. Um, and now recreational marijuana. And so I actually had a patient come to my appointment with like a giant pot plant that he was going to try to trade with me, you know, because he didn't have insurance. So funny. I was like, I don't really need it, you know, like I'm already high on life, you know. So anyway, I mean, that's just, it's, it's a different universe, okay. So uh, yeah, I know you have a meeting to go to, but I just thought you'd appreciate some of these Eugene stories, and I have many more. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you for introducing me. Okay, so, um, yeah, here's something I posted on my Facebook and Twitter. And, uh, and, and I legitimately feel this way, yeah. It's, uh, the people I've met here are so warm and welcoming. and it just be, I know there's people who are struggling with various mental health issues, but the fact that you all have come together and are so... Um, willing to discuss this and support one another, I think just says a lot about your school, and I'm really, I'm really proud to be here, so thank you for inviting me. And I want to share with you um, two questions that were recently asked by medical students that, that have changed my life in, in the last few weeks. Okay, so the first one, what was your proudest moment? So this was at a medical student retreat that I was leading um, in February. Uh, let's see, when was it? You know, early February, uh, I think the 9th to the 12th. So I was with, um, you know, a group of about 10 medical students that I sat with for four days in a little retreat on the, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And so that was a question asked to me, and I immediately knew the answer, and it was something that had just happened a few weeks before, which was the actual proudest moment of my life. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of the backstory because it started on January 18th when uh, her name is Dilshad Juman, a, um, the first female interventional nephrologist, um, three days into her first job as an attending at Mount Sinai, she went up to the 33rd floor, you know, the roof of a, of a building and, and stepped off. Um, and, and within an hour or so after she died, I received three emails. This is the first one. 
Hello, Pamela. I'm not a doctor, but a mother of three and a wife of a resident physician. Tonight I watched again the police taking the body of another female doctor, lifeless, into a body bag. Two doctors died from jumping off our 33-story building in two years, and no one seems to care. The hospital and everyone is so silent, they cover it up. No one talks about it. Someone dies, and everyone puts their heads down and ignores it and are told by the hospital to keep quiet, especially to reporters. Later on in her email, she had, I mean, this is just an excerpt, words can never describe how it feels to see a dead body outside your window, a beautiful, lifeless body of a beautiful doctor. Then... I got this email. I'm a physician. I have a career ahead of me, which I'm too scared to speak out against. I came home again to another suicide, another doctor dead from Mount Sinai in New York. I think New York is a horrible place to work. Conditions are deplorable for doctors, and you should investigate. Both suicides were horrible, jumped from our high rise. I'm convinced it's the exhaustion, the demands to perform at 100%, 24-7 to meet ridiculous administrative and financial demands, and he goes on. And then I received... I'm a health system executive in New York City, and one of our physicians jumped off a building this afternoon. Don't we have an obligation as a society to understand why each and every suicide occurs? How do we learn from them? If this were a patient who had just been discharged, we'd be all over it, and so would the regulators. These emails go on. These are just excerpts. I have permission from the first two to share them. I'm not revealing the identity of the third one, though I really admire that this man in a moment of emotional accessibility reached out to me and I think he was then overpowered by the other people in his institution to um, probably not engage with me thereafter but I do admire that he reached out to me. Um, it did help that five days before I had an um, article in New York, uh, oh, on the Washington Post on the front page of their health science section on physician suicide and the results of five years of my research so I think I was top of mind you know when this happened. So I did um, publish an article with a picture that was shot from the building, the wife of the resident physician, and that is Dr. Dealshaw Juman under a brown tarp with her hand that you can sort of see there. Um, this happened at 3.30 in the afternoon, and many hours passed, and now it's night, and she saw the police come and throw her body in the most disrespectful way into a body bag and drive off, and, and that would have been the end of the story because the hospital is not keen on talking about this. Her family is Muslim, and they don't want to talk about it either. In fact, they told everyone that she died in a car accident. So you have you know, censorship on both ends, and I'm in the middle. And for a variety of reasons, I couldn't let this go, probably because the number of people asking me to help was accelerating, and I'm in a unique position where I have a skill set where I can actually help. And so I couldn't walk away from this. And I started, you know, like staring at this picture. It's very intense. And um, I started to just think about, wow, how we honor our dead. Um, and, I, and I started to think, gee, like, other people don't just get covered in brown tarps and left on the side of the road. Like, why is this happening to doctors? And so I realized, like, wow, everyone else gets honored except doctors. Um, you know, like the one on the bottom right is a teenager in Sweden who died by suicide 10 years ago. They still maintain that site. People come and visit it. Um, you know, Robin Williams, of course. Um, and it's not just any types of death. I mean, suicides are honored because the teenager in Robin Williams and the quarterback were suicides. The quarterback actually was Washington State University quarterback, died by suicide, suicide two days before Dr. Juman died, and just spontaneously, you know, his jersey was hanging by the stadium, we love you, Tyler, you know, flowers, balloons, like all these things, right? And then the policeman that dies, you know, I don't know if that was a suicide, but it's in Oregon near my house. Um, you know, gets lots of, you know, they're all the other policemen come out, they do a special ceremony, they, you know, honor each other, they give the, the surviving widow his badge. I mean, they, they have a whole routine. They blow a bugle, they wave flags, you know. The bicyclists oh, throughout my town, which is a very, um, you know, lots of people bike, uh, commute by bike, you know, so there's some fatalities. And I don't know if you have this here, but, you know, they paint the bicycles white. They're called ghost bikes. And they, this one's been there in downtown Eugene for probably 10 years. The site is still maintained with fresh flowers. 
And, you know, so that, I was thinking, like, so why don't we do this for doctors? You know, maybe because it's at a hospital. But then at my University of Arizona in Tucson, Gabrielle Giffords was shot, and they filled, like, it was like a mound of teddy bears, you know, after that shooting. So hospitals do allow people to create spontaneous memorials. So I was like, why is this not? I now have close to 800 doctors that I've tracked and medical students who've died by suicide on my list. I, I've been on this for five years. I have never seen a spontaneous memorial for a medical student or a physician. It's just nothing happens. And I think this is dramatic. And so I, I felt like I had to do something since people were egging me on to do something. So I actually just showed up and led a vigil. This is, this is the proudest moment of my life. Okay, It happened at 6 p.m. on January 26, 26 uh, 2018, you know, despite uh, to the horror of her family who wants to believe it's a car accident, to the horror of Mount Sinai who wants to like not talk about this, I just decided to show up and post on Facebook that I'm leading a vigil for a woman I don't even know because I can't bear the fact that she would just disappear from the face of this earth be taken off their website at Mount Sinai as if she never existed. She put so much energy into her career. She had finally arrived at the pinnacle of success. And to just be, to just disappear just seems cruel. And um, it also is terrible for, by the way, the people that witnessed this. There were doctors in the hospital that were looking out the window that saw another doctor like jump off the roof of the hospital who were doing procedures on patients, you know, because these high rises are close by. You like, you see it. And that's 100, there's 450 doctors that live in that building that are wondering, there's children asking their parents what's under the tarp. You know, there's, there's, it's like, we have to address this, okay? And so I just, I eulogized her. I, the, so I did the vigil on uh, the night of the 26th. On the 27th, I rented a room at the hotel that I was in, conference room, whatever, renaissance room. And for 10 hours, I received people for 10 hours who came and told stories about her and I led a memorial service for her. And I, I just feel like we should all sort of be doing this. Like I shouldn't have to necessarily fly, I'm happy to do it, but I shouldn't have to fly from Oregon to New York to lead something that in the immediate aftermath needs to be done by the institution um, to help their own people who are grieving. And the people came to the vigil, by the way, that had witnessed this walking down the sidewalk and they were like whispering in my ear, thank you for doing this, and I, I now have closure on, I didn't know who she was, you know, it, we, we have to, we have to do something, okay? And then, so that was one question, what was your proudest moment? And I guess I just want to say to you, your proudest moment can happen today, it can happen any day. When you step forward um, and you uh, do it fearlessly and you behave in an ethical way and you are honorable in your intentions, even if other people are mad at you or you're going against the grain, like that could be the proudest moment of your life. And so I wanna encourage you to always be looking for, could this be the proudest moment of my life where I can step forward amid silence and do something that is actually life-saving? Because you don't have to wait till you get your diploma in medical school to save lives. Like you could save lives now. I would just give you all honorary doctorate degrees now. You know, Just consider yourselves doctors today and start doing the beautiful work that doctors do to save lives, okay? Don't, don't wait, because I'm now getting emails from people that say, what can I do, medical students, so I'm not the next one under the tarp? Okay, so what can you do? Well, this is a really good time. Prevention should happen early, okay? Like, when you wait till somebody, when you try to talk somebody off a ledge is not like the best time to try to deal with suicide. But to deal with suicide, it takes everyone, it takes a village, and it takes um, a way of relating to each other, um, like family members, like you really do care about one another. Like I'm sure none of you want to be in a situation where one of your classmates' parents gets a phone call from the police at three in the morning that their child has died. And it's sort of like up to us to be on the watchtower and pay attention to subtle things and to create an environment so that nobody's parents in here have to get a terrible phone call one night. It's terrible to get those phone calls. And so um, it was August 2016 when I got an email from a medical student who told me I was less stressed in Afghanistan than medical school, okay? And this isn't the first time that somebody has told me that they were less stressed in active 
war zones than medical school, which is a pretty dramatic statement. I'm, very, I'm a very curious person, so of course I want to know, like, can you tell me more, or what is this all about? You know, and what it comes down to is that the stress was incredible, but I had their back and they had mine. In an unsafe country and a future filled with uncertainty, I felt secure because we supported each other. So what this is all about is it almost doesn't matter. You can survive almost anything if you know that people next to you love you and are there for you and are not going to backstab you and you can trust them and they're really, they really have your back. Like, even if you die on a battlefield, they will drag your body home, you will have a burial, they'll get the flags, they'll put the thing over your coffin. Like, it will be, you're not left alone to die under a tarp, okay, and be left with nobody that cares. You know, there's 450 people in that building, and 33 people showed up for a vigil, and the next day when I did a memorial service, like, only 13 people were there, but two people were my cousins that came on Greyhound from Philadelphia, and then me, so that means only 10 people showed up. Now, just think about the population density of New York with how many medical professionals are there who knew her, and only 10 people came to that memorial service, though there were people streaming in all night long at the room that I rented. It says a lot for the fact that people in the building were scared to come because their school threatened them with termination if they spoke to reporters or had anything to do with this. They got emails that said that it is a breach of your contract to speak to reporters. And this is, you know, and I can go into more detail about minute by minute how this was handled in the wrong way by a medical institution. And I don't want LSU to be one of those institutions that just sends an automated email responder templates, you know, when suicides happen. Like, we can actually do this in a more personal way that's very healing for the survivors who are still suffering. And so, I think what the L LSU secret is, so this was after I posted that happy um, thing on my Twitter and Facebook, is that, um, you know, it is a family atmosphere here. This is, I'm very glad to be here because I had to fly to New York twice in, um, you know, two weeks the second time. It was because Dr. Oz wanted me to come on a show to talk about what's going on with all these deaths in New York City. And so, it is a very um, intense, place, New York City, and the medical, um, the medical system and, and healthcare environment in New York is, is very, it's a very stressful environment. Um, it's so nice to be in Louisiana. <laughs> I really like it here. Uh, everyone's friendly. The cost of living is reasonable. I mean, I think you guys have a lot going for you here. And, um, and I just think we could do it even better, you know, like there's nothing that should be stopping you all in Louisiana for being, you know, maybe the number one school in the country for taking on medical student mental health. Like, really, you could, you could do this. You could, you could create a situation here that is then replicated at medical schools all across the country. Because I think by the fact that you even have me here, um, when other, some other programs tell their, um, their residents to like take down my posts off their Facebook page and not to friend me or to unfriend me. You know, like there are some places that like they're not a fan of me. You guys brought me here. Like you're open to this. Like I commend you for um, being on top of this and for having a faculty that is taking this seriously. And so you have a lot to be proud of and we can build on that, right? And so uh, Randy, uh, at the bottom there, he, he actually went to one of my retreats, and he graduated from this school, in uh, medical school and residency, but I, and he was here last night. He came, I don't think he's here today, he had to go back to Baton Rouge, but he came to, to see the film trailer. And but he did mention something, uh, though he loves the school and, and, and he has nothing but positive things to say. Very interestingly, when he walked into this room, which I guess was the same room he trained in, because this is, is this a, is this, yeah, he went to lectures here 20 or 30 years ago or whatever. He said he had um, sort of like a reaction being in here that was um, a little startling for him, like he felt a little uh, PTSD from, um, from just all the, like he still felt in his body like the tension of like nervousness about getting an exam or failing something or whatever. And he said that he actually does every once in a while have dreams about um, sort of the fear of being in medical education here, like um, being maybe pimped or whatever. And he said he's never had recurrent dreams about anything else, but every once in a while he'll have a dream about something that happened here that's a little startling. So I think we can improve our teaching methods so people don't have like dreams later on and have sort of PTSD responses to what you're doing. 
I, I actually, when he told me that, I mean, I, had, I hadn't gone back to Galveston in 22 years since I graduated, but my mom, she graduated from Galveston and is an MD psychiatrist. We went back for her 50th year reunion, and it was my 22nd, and it was so cool, like a mother-daughter team getting to go back to their medical school reunion, but um, I didn't go back for 22 years for the same reason that Randy probably didn't want to come sit in this room because, like, it was just the memory of the trauma that I sustained that I think is unnecessary in medical training prevented me from wanting to even go back to Galveston. And when I went back there, I realized what a nice place it is, but I didn't quite really appreciate it when I was there because I was so distressed. And, and I met another woman there who said at that reunion, she was her, it was her 35th reunion, and she said when she walked into the medical library, she just started crying and she had no idea why. So I think people are having visceral memories of experiences at medical school that are not like ultimately helpful to carry into their future. So let's do this differently. So thank you for this wonderful group of people um, who are some of the happiest medical students I've ever met that um, fueled my interest in posting that comment. And I want to share a survey that they did before, um, I think before I arrived or as I arrived. And the outcome of this few questions are that about 56.3% of people claim to have good to excellent mental health care, or mental health, the state of their mental health they claim to be good to excellent. However, about 55% claim that mental health issues are a problem here. Okay, so we have work to do. And 36.5% are uncomfortable speaking to faculty, and 42% are uncomfortable seeking help despite help being available. And a third are comfortable with faculty and, um, and, and, and the help that's available. However, uh, one in 10 students don't know who to ask for help. And over half the students here are unsure if, what the resources are that are available. So even though you have resources, we're not really getting it out to students in a way that they understand, and uh, more than 20% don't want their school to know or hospital to know anything about their mental health. Okay, so we still have um, secrecy, um, sort of some barriers to break through, some education to do here to make it even more accessible for people who do even want to have 60% want peer support groups. Okay. And I think this is the essential part of this. I mean, the overall message that I would like to get across today is the thing that's going to save our lives, that's going to prevent you from being under the tarp or the person sitting next to you from landing under a tarp and their parents getting a bad phone call is relationships with one another. Like, we need each other, and we need each other from day one of medical school. And I think we've already proven ourselves as amazing, capable, intelligent, compassionate people to have been accepted to this institution. So that by the time you get here, I would like to promote the idea that everyone be fully embraced and not tormented in any way. Because like you're not a slacker, you wouldn't have made it here. You're not, um, you know, you're highly intelligent. And I would like for us to treat each other not like bad kindergartners, which I think a lot of doctors feel like they're treated that way by administration often but like the highly intelligent, beautiful, loving people that you are who came with pure, noble, humanitarian intentions, even the ones who seem like they're not and they're gunners, somewhere down inside, I think even those people have pure, noble, humanitarian intentions. They just haven't been promoted, you know? Like it's not, we can create an atmosphere where they want to be like humanitarian gunners, you know? like. <laughs> You could, you could turn all this around, right? Okay, so let's incentivize what we want to create here because social isolation of otherwise healthy, well-functioning individuals eventually results in psychological and physical disintegration and even death. So the solution to this is each other. We don't need a big NIH grant. You know, suicide, like I've said before, isn't actually really the problem. The problem is secrecy. <laughs> You know, once we break through the secrecy, the suicides, once we have relationships with each other, the suicides naturally stop happening on their own. And uh, just this morning, I got like a Google alert that I had um, an article in medical economics, which I didn't even know was coming out. It's uh, kind of fun, like to see more and more stuff coming out. But I thought this, it's a slideshow, which I thought, oh, I'll just add this to my slideshow. So, um, so basically, here are nine ways to combat physician suicide, which I apparently shared with them, don't remember. but. Um, here we go. 
And think about, these are, most of these have to do with relationships. So it just reinforces the theme that I had in my talk anyway. But um, number one is to talk about suicide and stop the secrecy, OK? Well, number nine, we're going in reverse, OK? Number eight, remove mental health questions from licensing applications or alter the wording from have you ever had a mental health condition to do you currently have a medical condition that would limit your ability to practice medicine safely? I think if any of you are in touch with the state medical board and can start advocating, I don't know what the language is in Louisiana, but if you can start advocating for this change, and then of course let the students know who most of them want to practice in Louisiana, geez, here's the wording of the question so you can now feel relaxed to seek help and even go on medication if necessary because you will be able to practice medicine in Louisiana after you graduate. Here's the wording of the question. Here's the wording of the question in our hospitals for privileges. You know, make it all very transparent so people aren't in the mystery of like, well, will I ever? I heard there's a question I might have to fill out. You know, just make it clear that they're safe and provide on-the-job support, especially for emergency department physicians, surgeons, you know, and, and medical students in these specialties on rotations are seeing horrible things. And they need on-the-job support when they have to tell a family their three-year-old child died or they lose a patient. And so, you know, the chaplain, um, listeners, we've talked about having professional listeners just available. You know, there are things that you could have available so that there's debriefing after difficult cases. Don't let people sit with this for decades. I have people coming to my retreats, a woman that came who um, was like close to retirement, who started crying about a miscarriage that she witnessed like 20 years before, just out of the blue with no provocation. I think she was just sitting in a comfortable space with people who she felt she could, I guess, experience finally her first tears about something that she's been containing for 20 years, that can't be helpful, you know, to contain these tears for decades. And afterwards, you know, she said, I'm just happy that I was able to cry. I haven't been able to cry for 10 years. You know, so this is, humans are supposed to cry. You shouldn't be written up as unprofessional. Um, you should cry frequently in medical school. That's how I got through with my soul intact. There's a lot of things to cry about, and I think you shouldn't hold back. The more crying, the better. I think you should be concerned if you stop crying in medical school, something's gone wrong, okay? So that's my best advice with that. Keep Kleenex close by. Um, so help doctors off the assembly line and out of big box clinics. If they're not happy, help them open independent clinics where they can practice in alignment with their values and original intent when they entered medical school. I really do think we should be teaching to the personal statement of the person who's entered here. We should be at intervals asking them, how are we, do how are we doing at LSU getting you to your goal of being a rural family doctor in Houma, Louisiana? How are we doing? Are you, do you feel like you're on track? Is there anything else we could be doing for you? You know, like, don't let it go. Where you, they deliver this beautiful personal statement. It goes in a file, gathers dust. By the time they graduate, they forgot what's on there. Nobody ever brought it up again. You know, like, teach to their personal statement. Teach to their dream. Ask them at intervals, what is your dream? Like, gee, what do you want to do when you get this amazing degree here? You're going to be able to do whatever you want. And so take an interest. Inspire them, you know? Um, befriend one another. Focus on collaboration, not competition. Mentor other physicians. Um, spend time together outside of the office. Take a colleague out to lunch. You can see the theme here. Um, hand out thank you cards and notes of appreciation. You know, random acts of kindness would go a really long way to improve the environment that you already have that's pretty good compared to Mount Sinai and other places. Um, change the culture from isolation to one of community. And I want to help you do this. And so for anyone who's here today, I have a teleseminar that's starting on Sunday where I actually, it's a 10 week course where I walk you step by step how to open your own clinic, how to live your dream in medicine. It's usually $1,800, but I'm gonna give it to everyone here for free. And all you have to do is go contact me on, um, on my website and, and you can read, you know, you can look at the teleseminar and read all about it, see if you wanna do it, but it's a good deal. So, um, so that's one thing that I'd like to put myself out there to help you. And so what can your school do for you? Here's where I think administration can take the lead in helping what students have started. We had a town hall meeting yesterday where I got like amazing information from students, things they were able to share with me that they don't necessarily want their name attached to and handed straight over to administration. But I think I'll hand it over to one of you who can keep it sort of anonymous, but like mine this for information. I have some things I wanna share that, I, that came out of this that I think are really important. 
First of all, we have to enhance the relationships between students so that they're solidly on a foundation when they start their academics. So this, this sort of, instead of a super quick, callous, stressful two-day orientation that's all canned before starting med school, offer a week-long retreat sort of thing, like to get prepared for the journey and meet classmates, create a study plan, learn what exercises you like, get nutrition tips, find out where Whole Foods is, you know, whatever you want to do, right? And, um, and, and really support this, you know, and some of the things that you could do during this orientation, which by the way, I am volunteering to come lead it, if you want me to do, because I'm really good at leading retreats, and we could do, <laughs> and we could do these in between like first and second year, maybe a two-day event, or between second and third year, like there should be a time where you like kind of can get together and revamp, start remembering why you're here to begin with, think about your dream, and during this time, you could help students find their best learning styles, you know, so that like before they fail their first test, they could figure out, oh, I'm an auditory learner or whatever. And they could find the other auditory learner, you know, give them a survey so you can figure out like what type of learner they are. Then they can like pack up together with the like 10 other people that learn the same way and be in their own little study group. They already know who's in their study group before they start, not kind of trying to wing it. You know, they figure out you know, get a nutrition plan ahead of time, try to figure out like what's the best thing to eat, you know, how am I going to, you know, non-medical interest groups, somebody said they went to your organizational fair for interest groups where everything was medical. You know, what about bonding with people over non-medical sorts of issues? I think it helps to like, to not be thinking about like biochemistry the whole time and like just do something like play tennis or, you know, it might be nice to have that too. Okay, so, um, and continuing with student relationships, maybe student think tanks kind of like this, you know, uh, for updating the curriculum. They have so many great ideas that are like zero cost to the institution that could be implemented immediately that would really improve the morale. And when you improve the morale, you improve the grades. When you improve the grades, you get pass everyone passes the boards. It all works like in concert, right? Um, you know, just fun things, puzzles, games, a scavenger hunt, looking for, I don't know, something, you can make this fun, you can make it medical, um, you know, incentivize working out. Community relationships, okay, people are here because they love, they love Louisiana, they want to stay in Louisiana, they want to, they want to love the people in Shreveport, they want an opportunity to reach out to people. These are some volunteer things that people want to do, like community projects, um, going into neighborhoods, like having, you know, just allowing people to get out of the library and out of the lecture hall once in a while to actually do something that would reinvigorate them. Um, relationships with health professionals, you know, and allied health professional departments. Um, you know, just, these are all pretty simple things. It's all about, like, just kind of lightening the load on the academic um, requirements a bit, you know, because people can learn on their own and you can condense some of these lectures maybe into more of a cliff notes version that they can have standardized so that there's like you need a little free time to breathe because it's in free time that you build relationships and it's the relationships that are going to save your life and improve your GPA so like carve out some time in the schedule for relationships so they're not busy all the time and actually I guess Give yourself and give the students permission like say hey between three and six today you're not allowed to study no studying, we're going to do this other thing, and just, you know, some people need to be told, stop studying, okay? All right, physician relationships, they would really love to bond with clinicians and maybe not have as much contact with so many PhD, um, you know, teachers that are teaching sort of, you know, minutia that might not, they can't see the relevancy to what they're going to be doing in the future. They'd really like to get in with, you know, if they've come to become an ophthalmologist, you know, can they meet another ophthalmologist in their first year that they can bond with and maybe volunteer in their office or, you know, start following patients so that this seems relevant to their personal statement and why they're here. And um, I won't read all of these, but, you know, business course, you know, from physicians that are in successful independent practices. Wouldn't it be cool if they could come and teach at LSU so people could get an idea that, oh, wow, it is still practice. It's still possible to be in practice as a solo physician. Um, patient relationships. So this is actually what saved my life. You know, I almost could have ended up under the tarp because I was suicidal. And what I decided is that I was going to ask my patients for help because for some reason I just did not feel like the profession that wounded me would have the help that I needed. So I thought, let me bypass, sadly, my profession and just go towards my patients 
and my community and ask them for help. So I did these town hall meetings, and I won't go into everything that I did, but my patients basically designed my own practice. They wrote my job description. I've been really happy. And one of the things that I think is one of the most beautiful things that we can all do that you should sometime in your medical school experience try is doing a house call. Doing house calls like brings everything together. It's medical. It's going out into the community. It's being with a patient. You know, if you could somehow, I think a cool idea is get assigned to a family in Shreveport and be their like medical student slash, you know, advocate slash eventual doctor and follow them for the four years that you're here and do house calls every six months with them to check in with them and see how their children are growing up and check in with their parents and that would make you feel like a part of the community, a part of their family. Maybe they'd invite you to Thanksgiving dinner. Like you just never know because you can't always get home. And so I just think we should sort of start adopting one another like that. And I want to share a house call that I did that um, a patient, and by the way, so patients, they're not as smart in biochemistry. They don't have the book smarts, but they have the common sense knowledge that you need and they have the love and support that they want to give you. And so I think we're, we have so many, I know institutions are under financial pressure, you know, and all of this, but there's so many untapped human resources of people who want to help you, but you haven't asked for help and we haven't created the environment where people feel okay to do this. So I want to share, this is a house call. If you ever get a chance to go on my blog, just look up house call on a hundred foot cliff. This is a guy who drives a hundred miles to come see me. He's out in Newport, Oregon. Um, his name's Johnny. He's just the sweetest guy. I love this guy so much. Um, he can't stop talking. He talks way more than me. I can hardly get a word in edgewise. Um, and uh, this is us uh, doing a house call on a cliff <laughs> overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And um, I actually do my retreats in Newport. And what's really funny is I just got the idea in February. Oh. I should have Johnny come talk to the medical students. So he teaches my retreats now. He comes, he puts on his little jacket, he gets all dressed up, he comes with notes, and he is so inspiring that at the end of my retreat, the medical students, they didn't want a picture with me, they wanted a picture with him. And they even put him in their cell phone as Johnny, my life cheerleader, and he gave his phone number to all the medical students. They're all gonna call him if they need any help. And I want you, this is sort of like my last slide, so I want you to have a, a to see a video, if I can figure out how to, uh-oh. So my screen went black, but let me see how, oh, there we go. Okay, how am I gonna do this? Johnny, I'm gonna move him, hold on, wait a minute, I know I can do this. If you can, there's a video underneath here, but, oh, wait a minute, da, 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 da. so here's the video. All right, if I, you have to move it that way, and then you have to go full screen, and then do full screen, and then there you go. So it's um, it's called "Can House Calls um, Prevent Physician Suicide?" It's just kind of this weird thing that I thought of two years ago when I made this. Um, it's kind of a weird entry. Sorry, it's it's kind of gruesome, but whatever. Um, but. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean, mean this. Now, why do you think more doctors aren't doing house calls? Well, I really think a lot of them are kind of afraid to. I think they're afraid to be real people like a uh, uh, patient would expect a doctor to be. And I think they're just afraid to open up and, and kind of go to somebody's house. They want to be safe in their environment. And I really think that's something that maybe they should kind of look different at and, and change their attitude about how they want to approach their patients. They, they just want to feel safe and, and they're afraid to open up sometimes, I think. They, they've kind of lost that doctor-patient um, touch and they, they need to get back in touch with their patients in that. I think they would really enjoy it more. They would enjoy being a doctor again instead of just being somebody that wants to write a script out. <laughs> And you think this will actually help the doctors, huh? Oh, very much so. I you, know, you know doctors have a high suicide rate. Why do you think they have such a high suicide rate? Well, because they don't open up. They don't open up and be people. They, they close themselves in. They create blocks. And, and that's part of the problem of not being out to, to go visit a patient at their house and things like that. They need to open up and, and, and be more friendly. Be a people. They're, they're people too, just like we are. 
You know, it's just like we're all people. And, and, and to have a doctor, you know, be personal is, is very important. It's almost like they've forgotten why they wanted to be a doctor. And what do you think about doctors and patients who hug at the end of a visit? <laughs> Hugs are the best part. <laughs> I try to stop it. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and you've walked out of there with some balloons, huh? Oh, yes. Walked out with balloons, walked out with hugs. And more, more, more than once, I've walked out, of, walked out of your office when I went, went back to go to my car and and there'd be somebody else in the parking lot and everything, and they'd say to me, Johnny, you, or they'd just come up to me, wouldn't even know who I am, and they'd come up to me and say, you sure look like you're happy. And I said, I just went and saw my doctor. And then they automatically said, well, who's your doctor? <laughs> and I tell them who you are, and, and, that, and they said, well, you just look like you've had a good time. And I says, I always do when I go see my doctor. <laughs> And, that, and that's happened. That's happened more than once. <laughs> you know, people, well, even when I go to the bank, you know, or I talk to people after I've gone and done my visit, you know, they'll just say, you know, you really, you just feel like you're a whole different person. You feel really uplifted. And I, and I tell them I am. I've had people, you know, that have driven me back and forth for my visit because I, I haven't been able to do my drive all the way, do the 100 mile drive. And when I come back out of there, they said, are you sure you went and saw your doctor you're just too happy to go to the doctor's office <laughs> oh no I saw my doctor and it, it just had a great time and it always is a great time I've never never left your office even when when I've when you've told me something that I may not have um, you know known what was going to happen or something like that you know after you've talked to me about it I can leave and I feel good I know that I've, I've you've set me on a path to make things better if I've had something that's discouraged me and you know that's something that's really missing in a lot of doctors they don't take time to to talk to their patients they don't take time to actually treat them like a person they just you know an account number to them and, and they in and out real quick you've always taken time to talk to me as long as I want to sit and talk and and you may have somebody sitting out outside waiting for their appointment but then again you go out there and you tell them well it'll just be a little bit longer and they're happy they're happy because they know that when they get they, their turn they'll be able to sit and talk to you and, and talk to you about things for as long as they need to to be able to feel good about where they're at too so don't you think this is the best job ever? Oh yeah, I think you got a good job. <laughs> I wish, I wish maybe way back when, if I was going to be something, if I could have been a doctor or something like what you've done. But it was always before when I saw a doctor. It wasn't. It didn't a good, make you want to be a doctor. It didn't. It, well, I always kind of thought that isn't what I want to be, you know. And I always felt like I wanted to be a good person. And you ended up being a doctor who's a good person, and that really means a lot. That just means a lot, you know, because I know it comes from the heart instead of coming from the pocketbook. <laughs> making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the truth. <laughs> it is. <laughs> You've done a lot of good to, to, to shit for a lot of people in that there. And hopefully you can do good for doctors too. Yeah, hopefully I they, think they all want to be doing this. You know, hopefully they can uh, have, sit down and talk to you and, and kind of see that they don't have to be under all the stress that they're under. That sometimes they create their own stress. And, it, and if they were just to kind of change their attitude how they go about things they would have fun they would enjoy going to the doctor's office that's where they work and they would enjoy you they'd wake up every day and go I'm ready to go to work I'm happy I know I'm going to feel good about going to work today and you know feel good about what they do and that's that's important they need to feel good too besides having a patient feel good the doctor's got to feel good because if the doctor's not feeling good for any reason that's going to carry over to their patient they they, they won't be able to, to really treat their patient the way they should be. Yeah, if they feel depressed or burned out or suicidal, what, what kind of health care is that? Right. Where, where, where do you get, how can they help somebody else when, when they need some help themselves to be able to get through things? When they, when, if they just looked at things in a different way, they would be able to say, hey, I can change this. I don't have to be this way. I can be happy. I can be excited about seeing my next patient. Okay. Oh, God.
So you have a lot of uh, patients who want to help you, and I think we're not asking them. You know, they're really smart, and they've been watching you, especially if you've been their doctor. If you've been their doctor for three, four years, like, they have a handle on, like, you know, they know that you're stressed out. They want to help you. Anyway, I'll stop now because I could talk forever, and so could he. But, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything that you want to ask. I hope that was helpful. I hope that gave you some, like, sort of easy things that you could do today differently and ways, yeah, so. Any questions? Um, I haven't seen it like with my own eyes, but I've heard from people in other institutions that it's 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 really working well. It kind of depends on, you know, the buy-in of the faculty and sort of how they, you know, they need free time to be able to do some of this. So, so yeah, I think once they can get together in these peer support groups, it's very very helpful for them. Yes. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have a neuropsychological evaluation before you pursue the career of your choice just to see like if you have the stamina. To, but it shouldn't be used in a punitive way. Like I don't want medical schools to be like, okay, everyone has to go through this. If you show any signs of you know, anxiety, you're out. Because you know, honestly, a lot of us pursue this profession because we have had wounds that we want to heal and help others with. So many of us are motivated to come here because we're sensitive people who have seen things that are traumatic in our personal lives and we can be supported so that we can become like truly the compassionate loving doctors that we'd intended to be but I do think it's like informed consent like when you pick up cigarettes and it says warning you know lung cancer like it's your choice then whether you want to do it or not like you need to know okay here's the risk of to my mental health of this type of a met of this field right and here's my score on this you know am do I have the stamina to make it through. You know, like leave it to the individual who's fully informed to decide. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Weibel, for coming. She's available until two if you want to hang out afterwards and ask, ask her some more questions. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for joining us for Mental Health Awareness Week. And if you haven't gotten the chance, check out our displays that are right outside the library. Um, it's a lot of really powerful stuff from our students, faculty, and staff. And give it up for Dr. Weibel one more time.